Um, at this time, we'll now hear from our open microphone speakers. Madam Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This morning, you have Hello. 23 open microphone speakers. I'll go ahead and recite the speaker guidelines. Speakers must observe the same rules of propriety, decorum, and good conduct applicable to members of the city council. Any speaker making personal, impertinent, profane, or slanderous remarks or who becomes boisterous while addressing the city council will be removed from the session. Individuals will be given three minutes to speak. When your time is up, please stop. Address your comments to Mayor Johnson only. Your first speaker will be Kyle Ogden. Thank you, Mayor Johnson and members of the city council for the opportunity to be with you this morning. The Thanksgiving Foundation appreciates our strong and growing partnership with the city of Dallas. We seek to be shoulder to shoulder with you and other civic leaders as we work for a city where all people can have a thriving, flourishing, and joyful existence. As we have witnessed over the past few weeks, this country is crying out for action. And we applaud the residents of Dallas and city leadership for being among the loudest voices for change. The Thanksgiving Foundation wants to help facilitate our ongoing work. We have created a banner memorializing our city's commitment to end racial injustice and inequality, and it will hang in the ground floor lobby of City Hall for the next several weeks. I would like to buy, invite you, Mayor Johnson, members of City Council, the city staff, to write one action each of you can take to help end racial injustice and promote equality, all in support of building a better Dallas. Once everyone has had the opportunity to personalize the banner, we will remove it to Thanksgiving Square where it will hang on display. In closing, I encourage us to change our paradigm from one of crisis to one of opportunity. I pray that you will seize this moment and be unwavering and relentless in the pursuit of building a better Dallas, using your power to turn hope into reality, shifting the future for all generations to come. Thank you again for allowing, allowing me to join you. Please stay safe and well. Thank you. Your next speaker is Natalie or Natalia Padilla. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to speak. My name is Natalia Padilla. 900 million that come to the city of Dallas economy is thanks to the arts. In 2017, the city of Dallas, through the Office of Cultural Affairs, launch a cultural plan to engage local arts and to bring experiences to, to these experiences to low-income communities. This plan was going to support a huge aspect of our economy, but also was going to bring arts to low-income communities to decrease the gap of inequality and inequity. The objective was to shift the funds program to support these neighborhoods. After three years of working on this, you're freezing these grants. That, we are, that we're already honored to the arts, and this budget was already assigned and designated for these low-income communities and for Dallas. Freezing the funds are wasting three years of planning from the city, are creating a bigger gap of inequity, and unhurting the ecosystem of the arts. I'm requesting for you to unfreeze the funds that were already designated for this project, and to please let us adapt to COVID-19 to let us provide these experiences that are really needed right now to create our project via internet if necessary. So please don't freeze the funds so we can do our work with low-income communities. These kids need them right now. My projects in particular have a focus in education. So this is gonna be beneficial also for Dallas ISD. I just, you know, I just need your support. This is my life, this is my work for low-income communities. So that is my request. Thank you very much. Katie Matamoros. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hello, uh, I actually, I am from District 1. I decided to, I wanna say Black Lives Matter. I decided to peacefully protest because I truly believe black people are targeted by police in America. I don't agree with it. Not only that, I'm sick of the racial inequality in education where I work and the system as a whole. And I will continue to protest. DPD has not scared me. We're just getting started. 
Um, I'm here to talk about what happened on Sunday, May 31st, the first day of curfew. I watched the previous city hall meeting where a uh, city hall member, Omar, asked the chief uh, why she had arrested before curfew. Her answer was, and I quote, for walking in large groups, there was no information given to us, so our goal was to prevent them from, from traffic from hitting them. And that is simply not true. We were cornered, shot at, and pepper sprayed by DPD on the sidewalk because they were eager to make arrests the first day of curfew. Charges have been dropped for all the other days, but not for the first day of curfew. I need you guys to look into that. What was the reason for these arrests? The officers' lives were not threatened. Why would they come at us with violence? DPD could defend themselves from a group of young unarmed people. We begged with our hands up to be let go to our cars. To my understanding, it is my right to protest peacefully at any time without needing to notify DPD of what I'm doing. What was the reason for our arrest? We need an apology and charges of anyone unlawfully arrested and charged with pedestrian on the road citations before curfew on Sunday, May 31st. They need to be dropped immediately. I was given a citation. None of us in jail had ever had a record before and people with visas were detained. This can affect citizenship immensely. We need your help. Not only was I physically harmed, but more important is the mental damage this has caused me. Now I have to visit a therapist through my job due to the damage. I felt attacked, harassed, and violated by the treatment I received while in DPD custody. As a public servant myself, I understand we are held to a high degree of scrutiny. The officers who treated me this way need to be held accountable for the physical abuse and mental trauma they caused me. If I did the same to a student, I would be out of a job and possibly in jail. Never in my life have I felt ill towards the Dallas Police Department until now. I was born in this community, I live in this community, I work in this community, and I have hope that you guys can bring justice to this community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kevin Wiley. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Kevin Wiley Sr. and I and my son Kevin Jr the nearest Green Hill High School alumnus, a staff of four paralegals composed of Dallas Law Firm of the Wiley Law Group, CLLC. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of infrastructure investment in Southern Dallas. It was exactly two weeks ago when my valued client, Mr. Robert Petrie, owner of Skyline Ranch and one of the largest landowners in Southern Dallas, spoke eloquently to you with respect to continuing the policy course of investment in Southern Dallas infrastructure through bond financing. Technical difficulties precluded my offering support on that day. My apologies. It has been my distinct honor to serve the legal and business needs of citizens of Dallas for now over four decades with a heavy emphasis in southern Dallas real estate and commercial transactions. My most treasured remembrance in this course was the work to preserve the investment in the over $50 million Paul Quinn College present campus, formerly Bishop College, in the 1990s. I personally have not seen a more precipitous time for modest investments except the balance toward continued progress. We're looking at a $350 million UNTD campus, $235 million development by Centurion American Development Promise adjacent to my client Skyline Ranch, the completion of the $135 million door blue line extension to UNTD, promising rebirth of Redbird Mall and Fair Park, dynamic, dynamic growth of Red Dallas Agile Park and Ice Corridor Warehousing. And we're seeing the benefits of all the hard work of the past that has now led to the over $1 billion of public and private investment. And this is not the time to pull back from modest further investments to promise substantial returns. Hark back to the days in 1991 when Coma Control, my now deceased employer, invested $2.5 million to purchase the aforementioned $50 million Bishop College campus out of bankruptcy and attract Paul Quinn to relocate to Dallas from Waco, Texas. Little did we know then that Paul Quinn would be part of the vibrant education corridor combined with the UNTD campus. However, Mr. Cottrell, employing the same determination that led to his creation of the then largest black-owned business in the Southwest, Coline Corporation, now part of global leader Unilever, and the creation of the world's leading juvenile ethnic brand and ethnic hair care just for me, he could see the future. He believed in Southern Dallas. He believed in you and the new trustees of this vision. He wrote a personal $2.5 million check for a quick claim deed to the Bishop College campus from a bankruptcy trustee who could not warrant title. I am left as a living witness of the result of this extraordinary feat of courage and faith. He then gifted this camp to Paul Quinn for one dollar after spending additional millions of dollars for restoration of the vandalized campus. He did this with no headline. The only thing he got back was his name in the student union building and the satisfaction he had made a sound investment in the community he so loved. 
We owe it to his legacy to complete the task that an additional bond investment and badly needed infrastructure can do to complete his dream. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share the type of faith and courage of Dallas citizens that truly makes Dallas and America great. Thank you. Thank you. Drew Blackburn. Hello. <clears throat> um, this is why those pious calls to respect the law, always to be heard from prominent citizens each time the ghetto explodes, are so obscene. The law is meant to be my servant and not my master still less my torturer and my murderer. To respect the law in the context in which the American Negro finds himself is simply to surrender his self-respect. These words are from James Baldwin in 1966, and they are no less appropriate than they were 54 years ago. This country, this city is sick. State sanctioned police violence is a cancer that cannot be cured. It will not go into remission. You must defund the police and invest in our communities. Your brave constituents are risking their lives marching through the streets during a pandemic to tell you this. Listen to us. All Black Lives Matter. I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Reed has canceled. Luke Haskell. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, I'm gonna start my timer. Um, I just have a couple questions about the presentation for the mid-year appropriation adjustments. Um, I see that there is an increase for the DPD by 5.4 million for training and equipment, and from grants for new hires and overtime by 6.5 million, um, which goes against the call from protesters in the street to defund, divest, and abolish the police. Defunding as in no more money um, for the police and to actively begin reducing the budget. On divesting, meaning community-led safety, investing in housing, food, education, and the arts, um, and abolishing, meaning no more police, no more prisons, no more cash bail, none of that. We're tired of it. Um, also, decreases in budget or freezing to uh, fair, uh, parks and rec utilities at Fair Park, which is kind of interesting considering it was built on a historically black neighborhood, um, and cutting money to youth access program. Not cool. Um, also increases to uh, mayor and city council by $100,000 um, while 500 staff are currently furloughed. What's that about? Um, yeah, I yield my time. Thank you very much. Francisco Espinosa. Hello. Hello, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Francisco Spinoza. I'm a resident in District 2. Thank you for being here. So despite more than two, uh, 200 speakers at City Council meeting last Friday articulating what it means to defund Dallas PD, some people, including members of our city government, are apparently still confused about what it means to defund Dallas PD. Yeah. So I wanted to use my time. To, I wanted to use my time to explain uh, what it means to defund Dallas PD. As it stands right now, more than half a billion dollars are being allocated from our city budget towards policing, by far the most expensive service in the city. Officers are deployed as first responders for to calls ranging, ranging from mental health issues to homeless encampments and so on. What it means to defund Dallas PD is to take a portion of the $500 million allocated to the police and distribute it among social and community health infrastructure programs and offices to for example, take some of Dallas PD's half a billion dollar budget and redirect it to the Housing and Neighborhood Revitalization Program and the Office of Economic Development, programs that actually strengthen our community and provide opportunities and a future for all the people that live here. To defund Dallas PD means to expand the Office of Homeless Solutions to help the people of Dallas weather the coming coronavirus wave of evictions instead of hiring the officers that will evict them. To def defund our police department means to prioritize our community's health and wellness over the purchase of military-grade equipment to intimidate our communities. It is to reprioritize budget spending, focusing on the humanity of all the people that live here. I hope that after this explanation, certain people who seem to be confused about what it is to talk about when we talk about defunding Dallas PD 
have a better understanding of what we're all talking about and why the people of Dallas are calling for action. Defund Dallas PD now. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia Calvary. Yes, hello, I'm here. I'm starting my time now. Hi, I am calling um, in regards to divestment of the police force. I've been watching some of these meetings and like the, the previous speaker, it seems like there's some confusion about what that means um, and what that means for the city of Dallas. Um, the primary goal for policing should be to reduce crime and disorder and success should be measured on the absence of crime and disorder, not police activity. And I feel in Dallas, we have chosen the latter and aren't really asking the tough questions because of personal allegiances to uh, the city manager and police chief. And while I understand that part of working in the city council is building team efforts and working together, but I also haven't seen that come to play at all during these meetings. Now, divestment means it does not equate no police or reduction of police. It's about using those funds for militarization to invest in our communities. And we've all seen articles about Camden, New Jersey, which so far may be the only case study for disbandment in the United States. However, we have a community policing model in Dallas at Jubilee Park. And so I'm really interested to know why you aren't talking to people with that organization, or if you are, to um, get data from them and personal experience. And all the data for them is actually on their website. So I think that that's something you all need to look at and understand as far as that goes. And also that divestment will also improve the livelihood and lives of police. It's not just about the community. If police have a connection and interaction with the community they serve, they actually have a, a, a better outcome in their own lives as well. So it's, it's, it's twofold, if that makes sense. So I yield my time. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Noel Park. Hello, can you hear me? Is it, yeah, it's Noel Parks. Yes, Noel Parks, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead, thank you. Okay, hello, my name is Noel Parks. I'm a registered nurse and a resident of Dallas, Texas. I attended the Monday, June 1st protest as a medic since based on previous protests, I knew police would res respond violently. When we got on the bridge, which no police had warned us not to do, we were almost immediately attacked from both sides. With no warning, police used tear gas and foam bullets on a crowd with children and teenagers. I was gassed and shot twice as I attempted to give medical care to a bleeding woman. Even when all of us were on our knees with our hands up, they kept shooting. They kept shooting as if we were enemy combatants and not peaceful civilians. Even after we were arrested, police neglected to give needed medical care. I watched a woman have multiple seizures and never be brought to the hospital. She stayed slumped over in her own urine for over three hours. Having police in our neighborhoods don't keep us safe from systemic issues like affordable housing, lack of access to education, and inadequate mental health resources. For most communities, more police means a higher chance of being harassed or murdered. The Dallas budget for 2020 allocates $517 million for the Dallas Police Department, but only $12 million for the Office of Homeless Solutions and $3 million for housing and neighborhood revitalization. The city of Dallas must change their priorities. How long will you sit idly by as our black and brown communities are ravaged by the systemic racism of our city, state, and country? I urge you to defund and demilitarize the DPD and instead use that money for education, healthcare, and social programs for the marginalized communities of Dallas. Communities that prosper are not over-policed. They are over-resourced. Enough is enough. Black Lives Matter. I yield my time. Thank you so much. Daniel Rosales II is not present. Jasmine Cantu.
Hello, my name is Jasmine Cantu. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. I'm a resident of Dallas in District 13, um, just for the record. Mayor Johnson, just like my previous um, residents of Dallas have mentioned, on a recent CNN segment, you told newscasters that you didn't know what defunding the DPD meant. Um, as well as with this city council meeting, I've watched the entire city council meeting last Friday, uh, in which multiple residents told you specifically what defunding the city uh police department means and what they wanted from the city council. They went in depth to explain to you what defunding means to us, the people of Dallas, and you had the audacity to claim that you didn't know what they meant. I know what they meant and I was there for the city council meeting, just like you. So again, just like my previous um, callers have said, when we say defund, we want money removed from the Dallas Police Department. The Dallas Police Department needs to be immediately demilitarized, among other things, so that it can stop terrorizing black residents. Money needs to be reallocated into our communities, into funding for health care, housing, and education. This is what the people of Dallas deserve. They deserve to live in and be supported by a city that wants them to survive, rather than a city that throws them into jail when they are unable to meet basic requirements of living, because, again, the system is against them. They do not need to thrive to have their life be considered valuable. It is unacceptable that the police department is responsible for and responds to calls for mental health crises, where they often show up with weapons and abuse those who need help. As a graduate student in the counseling field, if I were to serve a client like this, it wouldn't be an egregious breach of my code of conduct. I hold myself to a higher code of conduct than the Dallas Police Department currently does. I stand with the In Defense of Black Lives Coalition of Dallas and demand that the Dallas City Council defund DPD. We want our public funds to serve community health, safety, and quality of life measures for the historically disenfranchised. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Marissa Ocampo is not present. Alex Caleb John is not present. Alexandra Bear Chan. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. Hi, my name is Alexandra Bear Chan, and I live in District 1. I'm just here to say that, like the speakers who have come before me, I completely oppose recommendations to increase police salaries by 6.5 million, the police department by 5.4 million. I support the over 200 people who spoke before council recently and the other speakers today who are asking for defunding, divesting, and abolishing. I'm glad that the majority of council members said they were open to considering defunding, and I want to urge them to do so, considering that it's not the police who make communities safer because they don't prevent crime. And already the police, as other people have said, should not be the first responders to mental health crises. And instead, we should be investing in alternatives to police programs. So I want to reiterate the other speaker who's pointed out that the decreasing recommendations of funds for parks and rec youth programs and libraries this is the exact opposite of what needs to be done. Um, instead of making communities safer, police come in afterwards and their actions lead to the overpopulation of jails and prisons with brown and black folks. And these brown and black people who live in Dallas are the ones where police is most present in their communities and they are asking for the defunding of this police. So by investing in these communities, for example, homelessness and housing solutions, we will actually have a greater opportunity of making our city safer. And as a teacher, the proposed salary increase for police officers is further frustrating. I don't understand why cops continue to be paid more for criminalizing black and brown folks while educators are underpaid. I yield my time. Thank you. Mariah Jahangiri is not present. Anil Raj. This is Anil. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Anil Raj. I'm a resident of Oak Cliff. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the council. Last Friday, June 5th, the city council heard from over 200 speakers calling to defund and divest from the Dallas Police Department. Yet, on today's agenda, we see increases for police funding to the tune of over $10 million. I urge the council to immediately freeze any and all increases to DPD funding so the city can explore community first and police alternative initiatives. Frankly, I was embarrassed to hear Mayor Eric Johnson go on national TV and declare he does not know what we mean when we say we want to defund the police. We are not anti-cop, we do not hate the police. We need police to respond to threats by people like Micah Johnson or Brian Clyde or the many other violent situations we do not hear about because that is what police are trained to do, respond to violence. And they do it well, we need them for those roles. Gross. The police do not have the tools to respond to homelessness, mental health problems, drug addiction, hunger, or lack of health care and education. A police officer can do nothing for a homeless man or woman except move or arrest them. We as a city and more broadly as a nation have relied too heavily on police to solve our problems that they are not equipped to solve. 
Mr. Johnson, if you need another book to add to your bookshelf the next time you're on CNN, please look into The End of Policing by Alex Vitali. I would urge the council to look at Camden County, New Jersey, which in 2012 totally disbanded its police department. The city of Camden needs to have some of the worst crime rates in the country, but by focusing on community initiatives, violent crime dropped by 42% and overall crime by 79% within seven years. When Councilwoman Tara Mendelson says we have amnesia about our previous budget priorities regarding Dallas police, maybe she's forgotten that we are already pioneering police alternatives with the right care team in South Dallas, which in preliminary results has diverted 31% of the calls they have responded to from jails and hospital emergency rooms. We don't need police to respond to these types of situations. We need resources in our communities so that these situations do not occur in the first place. Again, I urge the council to vote against any increases to Dallas police funding at this time. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Stacy Brown. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, you can, go ahead, thank you. Firstly, I would like to thank the council and Mayor Johnson for this opportunity to address you today concerning the defunding of police. What do we really mean when we're calling for the defunding of police? This is by no means a call for anarchy, but rather for the reallocation of almost 60% of the total city budget that is given to the DPD to be re reallocated to health and human services to uplift the community. Maslow's hierarchy of needs tells us that in order for an individual to fully thrive, the basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, sleep, and air must be met. An examination of the city will show that these needs are far from being met in much of our community. We are asking that instead of investing in military grade equipment used to attack our citizens, we invest them in mental health services, including social and emotional learning programs for our youth. Instead of investing in police that break up peaceful protests, we are asking that these funds be reallocated and used to bring in affordable housing and community development. Instead of investing in a police force that takes the lives of its own citizens like Ken Clinton Allen, Santos Rodriguez, and Botham John, we invest in our communities to provide quality grocery stores and environmental projects such as the removal of Shingle Mountain that poisons <laughs> its citizens like Marsha Jackson. Instead of funding DPD and bringing in state troopers who are disrespect and abuse the very citizens that they are supposed to be protecting and serving, we bring in programs that promote the arts and the sciences. Nothing I'm proposing today is something that you haven't already heard, but I want to ensure that you are really hearing us. Are you really understanding what we are saying? Are you really listening? Are you listening to hear? Are you listening to understand? Or are you just listening to respond? I hope that you will really, really internalize what we are asking for and take this into consideration. I yield my time. Thank you very much. Caitlin Rabisky. Yes, good morning. Good morning, go ahead. I am a uh, resident of District 11. Um, and I'd like to say that there needs to be a difference between the military and the Dallas Police Department. We need to stop equipping our police like soldiers with rubber bullets and tear gas, which has been banned in war. We cannot, we cannot equip our doctors like doctors with PPE, our teachers like teachers with supplies that don't come out of their own pockets. In 2019, the Dallas Police Department had a budget of $516 million, while Fair Housing and Human Rights had a budget of $920,000. Four hours every other year is the only training required in de-escalation tactics. That is pitiful. Our Dallas Police Department is like a fraternity who enjoys hazing and cracking heads of the citizens it supposedly serves and protects, most recently displayed on the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge. People like Tony Timpa would still be alive if he had a mental health response team instead of a group of officers crushing his body against the ground <clears throat> while laughing and joking about his mental capacity. Diamond Ross needed an addiction specialist and EMS. This year, the DPD is over budget by five and a half million because the force is 77 officers larger than anticipated. Councilwoman Jennifer Gates said, we will find the money. 
to NBC DFW. If you can find the money for more police, you can find more money for fair housing, education, technology, and homeless solutions. I suggest we take it out of the rubber bullet and tear gas budget. CPD <laughs> spends far too much time on smear campaigns, like in the cases of Botham Jean, our black and brown communities, and our peaceful protesters. We need to defund the Dallas Police Department and refund our medical professionals, social workers, neighborhoods, teachers, and mental health counselors. We need to end broken we windows policing, people sleeping in parks with minor drug offenders, and those having mental crises need the help of health care professionals and social workers, not police like they're armed in call of duty. I'll say it again, there must be a difference between the military and the Dallas Police Department. Defund the DPD. I yield my time. Thank you, ma'am. Philip Clark is not present. <coughs> Michael Champlin. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, uh, Mayor and City Council. I'd like to start by saying that I'm absolutely ashamed of the way that our city has treated peaceful protesters over the last two weeks. Uh, if the city's response to nationwide calls for a reduction in policing is to hire nearly 100 more police and increase the police budget by $10 million, then you either aren't reading the room or you are reading the room. You're doubling down on the police to send a message to communities and specifically people of color in the Dallas area. Listen, y'all, I know tear gas is expensive, but we demand you do better. Furthermore, the optics of the mayor and council members taking a pay raise during what has been described as the worst recession in at least a century, to say nothing of the city employees who have been furloughed due to an international pandemic, doesn't inspire confidence in your leadership. I implore the council to put a freeze on the increases in funding for the already overfunded and overarmed police department, and to begin defunding the police department, reallocating the windfall to social services, mental health and drug treatment, addressing homelessness, and confronting poverty, especially among communities and people of color in our city. Defund the police. Black Lives Matter. I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Dolores Phillips. Dolores Phillips. 567 West Dickey Road, Apartment A, Grand Prairie, Texas. A journalist asked Chief Hall, why would she arrest peaceful protesters going over the bridge when she, she would normally give a citation? Arrogantly, Chief Hall said, I told them that I was going to arrest them, and I stuck to my word. Chief Hall cited Texas Penal Code 3 some point something being violated as obstruction of traffic. Well, at DPD, Right now, it's obstruction of justice, an ongoing cover-up, an open print qu quid pro quo for the cover-up. So you can't arrest peaceful protesters when you would normally give a citation. What I'm asking Mayor Johnson to do is to have a heart-to-heart, one-on-one talk with Chief Hall, ask her if she's in this to make it better for the citizens and the police officers. And if not, she should resign and go elsewhere. For 10 plus years, there has been a cover up within a cover up. My name connected to a fabricated police report of me using hands and feet fighting with police. On this wall is a degree that I earned when I drove to DPD October 25th, 2013. That meeting was prearranged by Mayor Rollins two to three weeks prior to October 25, 2013. Corporal Herbert Kotner, the arresting officer, said that he spoke with Mayor Rollins. I allege that Mayor Rollins told him to hold me to inflict fear. In the Dallas Observer for February 10, 2020, it states Robert Groden makes the city look stupid. 82 times over a seven year period, Dallas police arrested or ticketed Kennedy, Kennedy assassination ex Robert Groton 82 times for distributing literature and DVDs about the crime at Dealey Plaza downtown. 82 times the city's own municipal judges ruled the arrests were bad. Dallas has a history of arresting 
people who speak of injustices to inflict fear and to deter others for speaking of injustices. I shared with the city of Dallas that it was coming. The citizens are here and we won't change and we want it now and clear my name from the fabricated police report. I'm continuing to write FBI, the United States Department of Justice. I yield my time. Thank you very much. Abdallah Tirmiva. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. I'm here today along the In Defense of Black Lives Coalition to echo their four demands. One, divest from police. Two, invest in community health and safety measures. Three, free all our incarcerated community members. And four, end the war on black people in Dallas. As an abolitionist, I'm tired of confining public safety through the use of police. This is a dated white imagination. In the, in the past decade, reforms such as war officers, body cameras, oversight boards have failed us indisputably. We cannot reform an entity that is physically designed not to serve us. Cops do not protect people. They only protect capital, maintaining the status quo of repulsive class inequality, as we saw during the protests in Dallas over the past several days. This week, city council members in Minneapolis took a historical step in vowing to dismantle the police. I pray our city follows their lead. I yield my time. Thank you very much. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Um, I want to first begin by responding to a letter that came out yesterday on June 9th that was signed by nine of the city council members to the city manager. It was titled, quote, Reimagining Public Safety and Aligning Our Budget Priorities. Uh, I want to begin by stating that the letter states some really beautiful terms like, uh, quote, repair the harm of structural oppression and, quote, reimagine public safety. Um, I really hope the city council and our other public representatives are committed to those ideals, but I wanted to highlight there's other terms like, quote, neighborhood revitalization and, quote, home improvement. If you're committed to ending structural violence and it begins with a beautification project of a lower income community, that is not ending structural violence. If it does not begin with making housing accessible, right, because in the letter it says, quote, citywide access to affordable housing. If it doesn't begin with affordable housing being enacted in the city, all you've done is given more money to gentrification, right? So an arts program that's not for the residents who are already there, but a beautification for people to drive down from Wiley is not going to make the community better. It's just going to increase rents on people who can't afford already. So when you say structural oppression, you need to actually mean structural oppression. Defund the police cannot just become another way of increasing homelessness. I wanted to continue um, by stating that defund the police means to organize from the margins. It means you focus on the person who faces the most structural oppression and you make their lives better. Because when you start with the most marginalized, you make everyone's lives better. So let's highlight what often happens in Dallas when 911 is called. A wealthy resident will see a homeless person and be upset that they exist and the police will come and they'll give a citation or tell that person they shouldn't be there or to leave. And if the homeless person dares dare say I have the right to be in a public space, we arrest them. I don't know if you know this, but you cannot citation your way out of homelessness. You cannot imprison your way out of homelessness. The only solution to homelessness is housing. A lot of residents in the city of Dallas comment on the issue of homelessness, but it seems that our dollars are not going to actually solving that problem. If you want to end structural violence, you need to go to the source. Now, I wanna also raise the fact that over the last 40 years, we've seen a three times tripling of police budgets. Do we know where that money is going? And I mean, not just a big sum amount of 516 million going to the police. I mean, what is the itemized breakdown Thank of you. those funds? Thank you very much, sir. That's your time. We appreciate it. This concludes your open microphone speakers. Mayor? 